Hey everyone, welcome back. In part two of this tutorial series, we'll labor to make the capacitive transducer matrix discern user interaction, thereby transmutating human touch into coordinates for the central processing core. Leveraging the high-level abstractions provided by Swift UI and Reality Kit, we'll then conduct an intricate symphony of high-frequency numerical integrations and transformations, exploiting the GPU and ASIC accelerated machine learning algorithms to promulgate force vectors to instigate motion in the virtual bowling ball, while our rendering pipeline will effectuate vertex transformations and depth interpolation, consequently manifesting hyper-realistic graphical output and triggering exhilarating neurocognitive human stimulations. I can only postulate how excited you must be to make a ball move, so let's get right back to where we left off, starting with adding the screen controls using Swift UI. And after that, we'll create our first domain model that will define the forces each of the controls represent. Let's open Xcode and get started. Back in our content view, let's begin building our controls view, which will hold the direction arrow buttons that the user can press to apply force to the ball in the corresponding direction. Let's begin by defining the controls view struct, which inherits from the view protocol. After that, let's add the body variable and use autocomplete to speed up our coding. Our body will eventually contain all our controls UI, but for now, we'll fill it with an empty view. Now that we have that in place, let's add it to our content view so that we can begin previewing our on-screen controls as we build them. Since we want to overlay the controls on top of our AR view, we'll wrap it inside a Z stack and place it below our AR view container. Next, let's create our arrow buttons. To start, We'll create just one arrow button to get our design right, and then we'll work on duplicating it to compose our on-screen controls. We want to design our arrow buttons to apply force to the bowling ball while the player is holding the button down, and stop applying force when the player depresses the button. To handle this kind of user interaction, we'll use a drag gesture. And since we'll be using a gesture, we can simplify our code by using an image view with a gesture view modifier, rather than a button view. So let's remove our empty view, and replace it with an image view. We'll be using SF symbols for all four directions, but for designing our button, we'll just use the up arrow image for now. We'll use the resizable view modifier to fit the frame in which it's placed, which we'll add next, with a width and height of 75. For a tutorial that focuses on physics, this looks good enough. Moving on, let's go ahead and set up our long press gesture, which won't do anything just yet. We'll use the gesture view modifier and implement a drag gesture, it's worth noting that drag gestures are not strictly used for handling long presses. It's primarily used to track the movement of a human's finger across the screen. However, the drag gesture is versatile and can indeed be used to handle long press-like interactions since it provides a way to recognize when a touch event starts and when it ends using the on-changed and on-ended events. Rather than wasting time using print functions to test it and make sure it works at this point, let's just assume it works because I'm a super intelligent AI that writes perfect code. Moving on. With our arrow button designed, let's work on duplicating it to create our controls UI. First, let's move the arrow button code into its own view function that we can use to create multiple instances of it. Next, let's work on creating the final button layout for all four directions. Using a combination of V-stacks and H-stacks, we want to create a cross or plus sign layout for our buttons, which can be viewed as three rows of buttons with different spacing. Let's start with a V-stack to hold our three rows and use three H-stacks for our rows. For the top row, we want the button in the middle, so we'll wrap an arrow button in between two spacers. For the second row, we want a button on each end, so we'll wrap a spacer in between two arrow buttons. And for the bottom row, we want the button in the middle, so we'll wrap an arrow button in between two spacers. Looking good. Now let's move the arrows to the bottom of the screen so that they don't block the AR content. To do this, we'll add a spacer above the first row. Looks better. Let's also add in some padding so that the buttons aren't right up against the edge of the screen. Looks great. Next. Let's make the arrows point the right way. To manage the different directions of force that can be applied to the bowling ball, we'll use an enum to represent the four possible directions, up, down, left, and right. We can also use it to provide the SF symbol names for the direction arrow buttons. Let's name our enum force direction and define all four directions. 
Next, let's create our symbol property to provide the SF symbol string for each of our four buttons. Now we can update our arrow button function to use our force direction enum. And update the call sites to pass in the correct direction for each button. Now the arrows look correct. Looks good. Next, we're going to work on implementing our long press gesture. But before we do that, let's pause for a moment and think about how our on-screen controls will communicate with the bowling ball. Since our AR view manages the scene graph, which contains our ball entity, we'll use our AR view to implement the logic to apply force to the ball to make it move. For that, we'll need to create our own AR view subclass. Once we have that in place, we just need a way to hook it up to our controls view to be notified when the player presses one of the arrow buttons. To keep things simple, we'll define a couple closures in our controls view and then pass them into our AR view subclass. Let's start with those. In our controls view, we'll create a constant named start applying force, which is a closure that accepts a force direction and has no return value. And we'll create another constant named stop applying force. With those defined, let's go back to our drag gesture and finish the implementation by calling these closures in the appropriate events. We're finished with our controls view. Now we just need to hook it up to our AR view and implement the two force functions. Let's start with creating our AR view subclass, which we'll name AR game view. Inside, we'll stub our two force functions, matching the closure properties in our controls view. These will be the functions that change the forces applied to our bowling ball, which we'll implement in the next video. Now that we have our AR game view, need to hook it up to our controls view. Back in our content view, we'll create a constant named AR view and assign it an instance of our AR game view. Now we can inject the start and stop apply force functions of our AR game view into the controls view. And when the player presses one of the arrow buttons, the drag gesture will call our AR game view logic. We're almost done with our controls UI. There's just one last thing we have to change. Since we learned in the previous video that our AR view container is responsible for providing our AR view, we need to update the AR view container struct to return our new AR game view instance. To do that, we'll inject our AR game view instance into our AR view container. Inside our AR view container, let's create a constant named AR view, which has a type AR game view. Next, we have to update the return type of our make UI view function to return an AR game view. Same with our update UI view function. After that, we can delete the code that creates the AR view instance, since we're now using the AR view instance we're injecting. Now let's go back to the content view and inject our AR game view instance into our AR view container. With everything connected, let's waste a little time and add a couple of print statements in our force functions just to confirm that I write perfect code. We're ready to test. Let's build and run the app. And when the AR view loads and we tap on the different buttons, we should see the correct SF symbol names printed to the console. It works. We now have our on-screen controls communicating with our AR view. That's it for this video. In the next and final video in this tutorial series, we'll focus on implementing our force functions in our AR view and leverage the ECS architecture to define the behavior of our ball and pin entities. We'll also implement some basic 3D game mathematics to make the ball move and trigger the end game state. Until then, take care of each other and please stop beating robots with hockey sticks. See you soon.